Great. So thanks everyone for joining. I'll do a quick show with the group. So, and then we have Mike online and we'll see if others join us. Um, so to start, I wanted to give a quick overview of some of the upcoming workshops and stuff that the library is offering. Um, so they do have um, a whole series of workshops they've been doing around the Adobe Creative Suite. Um, the, live, the university is invested into it so that all students and faculty have it. Um, so they're doing a whole series. So there's quite a few of those. Um, there is the introduction to Zotero. Um, it's not really coding, but if you don't use Zotero, it is a great tool and you should be probably using it to keep track of all the things you have going on, everything that you're reading. Um, so coming up on the 20th, so this would be right after spring break, would be editing video, um, recording and editing podcasts. They've done this one a few times, so it must be pretty popular. Um, yeah, and then working with Orc ID, I guess is how you say it, or Orchid. Um, so, which is a whole set of tools that are really useful, especially if you get more into publication and grant writing and tracking all of that. Um, a lot of things will connect through your ORC ID and make life easier for you. Um, John also wanted me to mention that um, he presented the other week on some of the things he was doing with Quarto. And he wrote up a blog about it, which kind of encapsulates some of the things he presented to us and GW coders, and along with some other things. And it's very much a how-to guide. Um, so in R, of course, because it's John, and it's looking at um, working with a lot of big files and stuff, which is what John does a lot of. So he didn't tell me that much about it, um, but it looks like a good synopsis in it. He's going to connect it to the video. So he'll put the video in here and put this where the video is. So you can watch some of his video and then see some of the code and go back and forth between it is my understanding. Um, so I can go ahead. I'll put the link in a little while into the chat if you want it, Mike, um, and for anyone else who comes along. But we'll put the link definitely in the video for this so that people can have the link. Since his, he didn't do a short link. Like he could have done something nice and short that I would remember, <laughs> but no, he has Wait, a rather yeah. long ago. Yeah, he's gonna watch this video, I'm sure, so he can hear us giving a hard time about it. Um, so what we wanted to talk about today um, was the Django and kind of an initial discussion of um, web frameworks, the Django being one of those that is very useful. Um, so I've used it, I guess, on three sites now. So I'm not a super user of it or anything like that, um, but I know my way around well enough. And so today I'm just gonna talk like about how you structure it and set it up because um, it has a kind of unique structure. Well, I guess it's not that unique. There are others that use the same format, but once you kind of get used to how you structure the files, then it becomes apparent why it's really a flexible framework that can run really fast and um, support all kinds of projects. So, um, so there are a variety of frameworks that are offered for Python. So the Django is not the only one of them. It's one of the bigger ones. Um, Flask and Dash are also very popular frameworks for creating websites with Python um, in the background. Um, some of the other ones are more specific um, to different types of applications. I don't know. I found this graphic and I had not heard of a lot of these, but um, definitely Django and Flask probably are the two most popular followed by Dash, I would say. So, some of the websites that have been built with the Django, um, so NASA, YouTube, Pinterest, um, Spotify, um, 
So a lot of these are ones that are looking to serve data pretty quickly to people. And there's usually like some type of um, card components. It does those types of things really well as a framework. It makes it pretty easy to set up. Um, and there are others um, that use it for different purposes. I think Netflix used it for a while and then they moved to Flask. Um, Flask, I think, is a little lighter, so it, there's just fewer files that have to be read, um, so it allows it to run slightly faster. But they have pretty minimal, I mean, it's a complicated website, I'm sure, but it doesn't do that many different things compared to some of the other websites that might have more complication. But Flask, from what I understand, is a great framework. I've just never developed in it. Um, so one thing, I guess, to understand with web frameworks. Um, so the Django is the app part of the framework. So it would what resides on your server, um, along with other things. But it will hold your application. Um, it then connects, because the internet can't read Python natively, it reads XML and HTML natively, like the browser, it has to be converted through. And that's what the WSGI servers do. And the two most popular are UWSGI and I guess it's G Unicorn is how you say it, or Gunicorn. Mm -hmm. um, for my sites, for some reason, way back when I selected UWSGI and I just stuck with it because I know how to make it work. Um, but they basically do the same thing. They're just a way of converting what is known in Python to something that can then be interpreted by the web server. Um, and then you have your choice of web servers, of course. So if you buy into a virtual server space and you have a blank server space, the first thing you have to do is select which web server do you want on it. If you're then a host websites on it, if that's your goal. Um, I went with Nginx. Um, it's very popular. It's known for running pretty fast. Apache is really good and probably has more depth to it than Nginx, um, though Nginx does most things. And then that's what actually, when you go to your web browser and you put in a URL, it starts at that HTTP request. First, it goes, in my case, it goes to Nginx, which tells it where to start looking for files. And then it goes through the UWSGI so that it can translate between my Python files into something that it is gonna be able to read. Um, and all of that happens in the blink of an eye seamlessly and it just always works. Um, so there are some decisions if you decide to use one. Again, it's your choice, Zane. There is a ton of websites on how to use G Unicorn and how to get it set up. There's probably more support for G Unicorn than there is for UWSGI, um, but there aren't that many elements to it. So you change a couple of things and then it just runs. You don't have to keep doing it. Um, whereas the Django site is where you do all your updates and stuff. That's um, and once you get your Nginx server set up, you rarely touch it either. Um, within Nginx is like where you would have your SSL paperwork and stuff so that it can give you the HTTPS for secure logins. Um, it's where you route things. So like I have like seven or eight websites on one server. And so when the message comes in that it wants something from one of the websites, it has to know which one to go to. And that's what Nginx does along with a myriad of other things. It does firewalls and stuff like that that are built into it. So, so when you set up a web server, um, you basically um, get a blank Linux setup. So you get a bunch of folders that has stuff for Linux in it, most of which you should never touch um, because they do complicated Linux things. But 
What you do get is a home folder and that's where you keep users. And so if you have multiple people working on your website, you would wanna set up multiple user accounts on your Linux so that you can give people access to your files so they can edit those files as well. Um, so you wanna have users set up so that later you can assign them to the files. Um, and I'll show an example kind of of that. So this is pretty typical. Um, depending on how you said at the beginning, most often within this VAR, which I assume stands for variables, but I don't know, um, that's where you'll set up like the public part of your web server, the www, the public HTML part, so that people can't access all those other things. They only have access to what you've made public. Um, so there are the settings as what you would have in there as well. To give you an idea, um, so this is FileZilla, which is a quick way to access if you have a server. Um, so I come in, go to site manager. I'll just go in as me. So this pane, this pane here on the left are my computer files. Um, this pane here on the right uh, is my server files. So if I go to the top of it, you'll see that I have, I have a lot of them open, but there's the VAR file that I was talking about. Um, up here is my home file in which then I have users. So these are people that also have, that I've assigned access levels to my files. Um, so Jordan, for example, is one of my kids. Um, Parav is a student in coders who worked on one of our websites. Um, so, so all these are people who work on websites with me and then I can assign them access. So I can put them into a group and then give that group access to a website, for instance. So if I come down to the variables and I go to the World Wide Web folder to my HTML, here are all the websites that I, I guess it's more than eight even. These are all the websites I have worked on or keep working on. Um, and then they're assigned to different groups. Um, well, actually all these are open at root, but for example, if I go to this website, and then oh, the only thing that's available public is what I put into this public folder. Anything outside of that would not. Um, but you can see like I've given um, Justice, Justice Banson, he has access to certain files and he's in the group called tutorials. So he has access to anything within this folder. He can go in and make edits just like I can. And thus I turn off that access. Um, so this is just kind of thinking around how you organize files. Now you wouldn't have to run the Django in any of these. You could just write straight HTML and just put in HTML files. And then you don't have to worry about the UW SGI or the G unicorn because it reads HTML natively. So you just put an HTML file in and it would show up as a website if you pointed everything in the right direction. Um, or for example, um, I think this site, if I go into it, check. Yeah, this is a WordPress site. So WordPress uses PHP and it gets converted over seamlessly. So you, again, don't have to use the G unicorn stuff. Um, but you just host it within there and you can have all your files and stuff within there, which is really helpful. I, WordPress sites are great. Um, they're easy to work with, they're flexible. Um, you can do lots of cool things with it. Just not as many cool things as if you go to a more complicated web framework. So what I was gonna talk about today then uh, more specifically, Yeah, um, so this is a Django website that I've developed, it's fairly basic. Um, so these are YouTube videos and um, Vimeo videos about science papers. There are like 8,000 in the database. And if you click on it, 
it shows you that and you can give it a rating you can if it has a paper that's been added to it it'll show up and say like read the paper here you can report it being blocked you can share it you can add it to a watch later list so you can have your own personalized list of videos you want to go back to watch um it's a fun side project that i play with and it gives me something to do with the django um, so if I have an idea, then I can go in and do it. So I've done things like I've done dynamic searching. So if you do like this, it will update your search. And then it will, each time you put in something, narrow down your search. Um, so I'm going to talk kind of about my structure and framework of how this site works. So if we're back in the um zilla into the server where we're looking at through filezilla it's not this one it's the one below so it's this we share science one again only the things in the public html are public and then i have a folder called the name and then this is my setup for the website so it has as you can see let me see if i can make this bigger make the font bigger don't think I can make the font bigger on this, but so it has a database file that is creatively named DB. Mm -hmm. um, that's just the default, so I left it as it is. Um, it has what they call a socket, which is allows that WSGI to continuously move things back and forth. It doesn't have to make like other calls. It just has continuous access basically to the files because of the socket. Um, so now what I'll do is I'll talk about how a Django site um, kind of works. So when a user accesses a server that has Django on it, so that Django has those other pieces like the Nginx and stuff built into that little box, it has to then look for what is the URL. So, because we're not always just on the front page. So where is it going? It has to find that. And then it looks for what's called a view file. Um, and a view file is where you have like your functions that you have running for the page written in Python. And the view file uses two components. It uses a model, which is what tells it what to get out of the database. And then it uses a template which tells it how to make that look when it goes to HTML. So in the template is where you tell it like it's a two column website and it has images and that image then comes out of the database. So it goes back to the model and pulls the right image out of the database. Um, so they call this type of framework an MTV for model template view um, framework. Uh, it's fairly typical. I mean, a lot of websites use this because it's really fast. It's easier than keeping everything in one place. You just reference back and forth real quick between them. Um, so all of this thing gets shown, you'll see um, happens within my website as well. So here is a typical Django project structure. So your project is the overall. So in my case, it's the website. I just call it, we share science. That's the project. Within the project, then you have some core components that um, you don't, that just always run, they're just core. So like the urls.py on the left, um, that's what tells it where to go when it comes in. Now you can have multiples of those, but it gets more confusing. So I just usually keep one urls.py file and then it always just goes there, sends people to the right place. Um, the settings, as you would guess, are settings. Um, and then the manage Pi is how you create things in Python for this. So like if I want to create a new app, so each function of your website you would usually create as an app within it, and it has its own codes that run. If I want to create a new one, I go to the manage.py and I say new app, and then I create a new app. If I want to set up a virtual server for it, 
to test it out, I go to the manage.py and set up a virtual server. So it's a file that does all kinds of things. You never actually edit it. You just go to it and tell it to run things for you. So you, if you want to debug, you go to manage.py and tell it to debug for you. And it kind of manages all of that. Um, and now on the left, as you see, you have to have an initiation file within any folder within it. So if you create a new folder with stuff, you always have to put a Python initiation file in at the beginning, which is typical for Python users. Um, so then within an app, you would have um, a variety of files. And so once you go to the manage.py and say, I want a new app, it puts all these files in for you. You don't have to go in and create these. Um, it'll put a blank one in, for example, for each of those. And again, you'll see it has like the views file, which is where your functions go, the models file, which is where you build your database essentially. Um, and then the other ones you don't do too much with. The admin is like, so Django comes with a visual admin site that comes with yours. So if you sign in as admin, like you can do things and I'll show you. Actually, I guess I can show you real easily. So if I go to, um, oh, my password's on the other. Hold on real quick. Go back to too many Chrome logins. Um, we share science admin. There I go. So this is like the basic general admin. I can go in and see users, groups. Cards is what I call each of the video things, and I can see them all there. I can go in and edit them there. So that's like your easy access to your management platform. So that's what that admin, you can customize that in different ways. You can give different users different levels of access. And then you have your templates, um, and that's where you tell it how it should look as a website. And that's also then next to those, you usually keep any static files. So if you have PDFs, video files, you would keep all those static things there, things that won't change. And you can set up virtual environments. Most people have it as a virtual environment, so you can segment out all the different things you're doing with this Python from your other Pythons. So you set up a virtual environment for the project and just put in your Python packages that you're going to use for this project. So when it loads and runs, it doesn't have to load and run everything because you may do a lot of different things with different parts of what you do with Python. Um, so again, within mind then, if I come to um, here, you'll see that I have, currently I have three different apps. So I have a home app, which runs the home page. I have a cards app, which runs each of the cards that pops up with the video. And then I have an accounts app, which runs all the login pieces. So you can log in, have an account, reset your password. And I keep all of those separate then, and they each have adjacent groupings of those Python files that run them. And then everything else is pretty much as you would expect. I do have a scripts folder. Um, and you can put within a scripts folder unique Python code that you wrote to do something. Um, and so in this case, it's a load file. But instead of showing it here and all of that, I should just jump over to Visual Code Studio, which also then mimics all of this. Um, so I'm logged in. As you can see, I've logged in through SSH to my server over here. Um, and once I'm on that server, hopefully I'm still logged in. It should come up white again. Um, there it goes. So you can see all my different websites are there. And here again, the accounts, the cards, the home. Um, and so if I go, I can actually look at the script and see that it's just a small file to run. Um, 
and it actually just brings in the cards is what it looks like. I didn't remember what that one did exactly. So then within this, as I said, there's this URLs file, which tells it where to go. Um, let me see if I can blow that up more. There we go. So within the URLs file, um, it tells you how to set it up at the top, it just comes to fault. Um, and then there are some things that you add. Most of all, this is standard. It will just come with it. Um, I called my app main app. Um, but then down here is where it gets more interesting. This is then where you tell it where to go. So this is all the different pathways that you're telling it. So I guess this is a good example of one. So if someone goes to we share science slash watch list, which would be what comes after the URL, they use the views file, which we'll see in a second, and it runs the watch list function. And then we call this one watch list. Um, similarly, if they go to the contact page, if they go to we share science slash contact, it goes to the views file and gets the contact and that tells it what to put on that page. So the URLs is just basically directing the traffic where it wants to go. Um, so then it goes to the views. Um, if you see up here, I imported my views and I imported it from cards. I didn't have to, I could have imported it from a different app, but so if I go to cards, you'll see that I have a views file. And this is my views file. Um, go to the top of it. So these are my functions in Python that I'm running the site with. Um, and so you just bring them all in at the top, like anything. So there is a, one of the pages, for example, uses JSON files. So I have to import JSON. Um, I'll talk about forms in a little bit, but that's where you create forms. So there's a contact form, so it uses forms. Um, I brought in my models, which is my database models. Um, so let me go down to um, contact. So this is the function that runs the contact forms web page. So again, we saw the URLs. If you go to that URL slash you go slash contact, it tells it to run this function. Um, and so it includes a login form because there's a login at the top of the contact. So since that, if I bring up the website again, let's go to science. Oh, sorry. Um, so there's this login button on the top of every page. And if you go to, let's say the contacts form, um, to report a broken link, it's up there in the top corner. So therefore my Python must tell it how to make that and make it work. And that's what you're seeing. So the first thing that I put in here was the login form. So if login form is in the post, then it is a method where it calls the login form and people can put it in and then it will validate it. Um, and if they do make it through these if clauses and they have logged in, um, it takes them back to the original index page, which is the first page, and it says that it is logged in. So this render tells it what to do to put on the page after someone's gone through the function. Um, now, if they choose that they do not have a login, but instead do a sign up, it takes them through the sign up process. And at the end, it again takes them out to the front page after you sign up, it always just dumps you there. Um, so this is, the form then that actually is that contact form. Um, 
I put some common spam words in here. This is just a list. And then later I refer to that list so that if someone puts into the contact form any of those words, it never actually sends me an email because I was getting a bunch of spam email. Mm -hmm. I was like, they all say the same word. So I'll just make a list and take out things like revenue, business. Um, it was just random spam. And they cut it down to like, maybe I get two a month now that people don't use any of those. But then if I find a word, I just go and put it in my list and then that spam stops coming. Um, so it's a form, it has a subject line, it has a message, and then it does like the body would be this. Um, and then it tries to send it. And if it doesn't, then it gives an invalid header feedback. If it does send it, it goes back to the index page. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much, those are the functions that run that page of the website. So we're using Django to kind of do that. So the URL comes in, it goes and runs functions in the views file to figure out what to do for that URL. So it's always made dynamic that way. It's always using these functions to read it. Um, it uses the models. So if I go to models, so as I said, models are just how we set up the database. So every time you add something to your models, then it creates a new element within your database. So every time you add something or take something out here, you're changing the structure of the database, not what's in the database. Well, I guess if you take something out, then it does take all that data out with it. So you typically don't take that much out unless you know you want to get rid of it. But for example, I have in the database um, a variable called the article URL. So if they have an article that goes with the video, this is the URL to that article because it's research. So it's a model, it's a URL field, um, and it can be blank. They don't have to have it. Um, it can, if there's a DOI that goes with the article that goes with the video, then you can click here. I, then you have a field here that would have contained that. So the models are then all the data that we use. So those are what feed into the views file. So whenever the views has to have data out of the database, it looks at the models and the models pull the data for it. So if we think back to the graphic here, so again, the view file is pulling the model data into the view. Um, so that's how, like in the login one, it was going to ver verify that the person can log in because they are listed in the database as someone who has an account. So it's pulling that. It doesn't do that in the views. It does that in the models. The views just access the models to pull that data in. And this is what allows it to run really fast is everything's segmented, it runs very quick. It doesn't do things it doesn't have to do for the page. So there's, as you could see, there are only about 30 lines of code that were running the contacts web page, which is pretty simple. It can load that fast compared to if I was trying to do all this in HTML and keep all this straight, it would be a lot more complex. Now, what it doesn't do, though, in the views is make it look nice. It, it just is the functions. They're just functions. Um, so then we have these template files. Um, so I have a folder called templates. And so I am in the cards app. So these are the templates for um, the cards and then I have other templates for the whole website. But we'll just look at this one, for example. So each card. So this is kind of the HTML of the card itself. So you can see I load some static. I load the video ID numbers, the titles. Um, I use something called Bootstrap, which kind of 
has like the cards functionality built in. It's a plugin to the Django um, that has a lot of useful shortcuts though. So you don't have to write them. It's a popular one. There are several, but it's a very popular one. But now this looks more familiar. This is the HTML. So HTML has to have a head. So you have to have the head here, um, has a body. So each card has this. But now, as you can see, I can start to have quasi functions in here. So um, for example, here it says, if card.category imported is there, then I can show one link first, else if it's not there, I can show another link. So I can put logic into my HTML by using the templates. And that's where it gets a lot more interesting than just straight up HTML because straight up HTML, there's no logic to it. It's all just, it shows what it shows or you turn it off from showing. Um, so this is what the templates allow us to do. So for example, if it's a Vimeo file, it goes through this, or if it's a YouTube bio, file, it shows like this. And these, you can see basically what it's doing is, um, so if it's a YouTube video, then I give it a reference number, which is the card ID just for tracking. It has the image file. It gets that image from img.youtube.com-vi. And then you have to insert the URL in the ID, the ID from the URL, and then you put in 0.jpg. So that's how you get the image file from the first snap of any YouTube video. Like you could put any YouTube video ID number in here and it would show you the first page. That's what they use to show like that still graphic. It's this file. They actually have like five options. You can do zero JPEG, two JPEG, three JPEG, four JPEG. And they're different sizes, different dimensions, stuff like that. But I use zero and I use it at 100% width. Um, so yeah, that pretty much makes each card. Um, each card has a wish list where I said you could click on it and add to your watch later. I, it was called wish list when I copied it from someone else's work. So I just left it as wish list. But technically, I call it on the site watch later. Um, and that toggles, so you can toggle it back and forth. If you click it on, it goes to your wish list. If you click it off, it goes out of your wish list. Um, and this just puts that button there. So it says, if there is the card ID in the wish list, then it gives one. The user has to be logged in, so it has to check for user authentication. Else, it just gives a blank button. And if you click on that, it tells you to log in. And then that's it. That's the whole card. So that is showing us that created one of these. So, um, and this is the toggling. So see, since I'm not logged in, it will tell me to log in. Uh, but this one doesn't remember my password, so I'm not going to put it in. But trust me, it works. It, um, and then there's a different one for, like there's a different template for this because it looks different. So if I go back to my framework, um, so that's not in cards, that would be with, I think that's within home and templates. Yeah, it's the details view is what I called that. So this is the, template slash HTML file that creates that. Um, so I put in some custom style sheet stuff for wrapping the video. Um, yeah, so if it has a card, so like here it says, if the card has a DOI, then put in card DOI and then put in the information and pull it out of the database. So these are things that I'm pulling out of the database are just in those curly brackets. Yeah, and then I guess the kind of, one of the things that's really nice about it is, so you're doing all this in Python, so you can put in as much complexity as you want to it. 
Um, but you can also then like run things through other Python scripts that you run. Um, so for example, I'll try to remember what I use this script for. Um, yeah, so here, what I'm doing, whenever I run this script that I call node, we share science, um, it opens up, oh, I know. So I had all these links to all these videos in a CSV file from an old website that was done in PHP. So that's why I have 8,000 of them. It was an old website. So I had this CSV file and I wanted to load the CSV file into the new database. And so I wrote this Python script that I ran. And what it did is it went to my, I called them pins, be, um, the cards. I called them pins before. And it was in a cleaned up database. I'd taken out a bunch of stuff. So it read it. Um, and then it went through and deleted all the cards and all the categories from the past database, from my training databases when I played around with it. And then it read in each row. And for each row, it put the title, the URL, the DOI if it was there, the category. And so then it filled in my database with the 8,000. Um, so that's why I'd written this script. Um, but you can integrate Python stuff any way that you can imagine into it. Um, and it runs really fast, which is nice. So, because it's complicated the things that it's doing. Um, the only thing I'd mentioned since we're here and we have just a couple minutes left, John said I should say something about, I use Copilot, um, which is like the chat GPT for your visual code for writing code. Um, so you can see it's turned on down here in the bottom. I could deactivate it or activate it. Um, so if I start to write a function like, um, I don't know, that's great YouTube. Let's see if it tells me anything. Oh, I, yeah. Now, of course, it won't tell me anything because, mm -hmm. yeah. There we go. Let's see if it pulls up. So it gives me like a possible set of code, like tab. It just, but actually that doesn't scrape YouTube. It just gave me my same one over again. Um, but basically that's the idea behind. So um, let's see, let's see what it can. So this is how to add categories. Um, so it's, it knows what I am working on so it uses things out of my other functions, but then it also connects the GitHub and gives ideas out of GitHub as to things I might want to do. Let's see what happens if I start a new file though. Say open a new Python file and I write the, see, like it says, do I wanna add A and B return A plus B? So um, now let's see what happens if I do scrape YouTube. Let's see if it brings me up anything useful. I, that's not even code. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how it works. I don't use it that often, but it's kind of nice to have when you're searching around for ideas, it will give you thoughts. Um, of course, now you can just go to ChatGPT and say what you want to do, and it will also do it. You can say, give me five different functions that do this and then choose. Um, but yeah, it just it's easier if it's integrated in. So, okay, well, hopefully that, is of somewhat use. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Thanks Mike for joining online.